I'm going to read to you a quote from a text message, a, um, just an open question that a brother had asked. Um, and because of this uh, question, Lord opened up the scriptures on this unto me, and uh, we're going to talk about this. But uh, a beloved brother, you know who you are. I know God's in control, but why did he allow children to be killed in sacrifices by pagan rituals and the modern version of abortion? Hmm. Very good question. You can call this video kind of a part two to the previous video. What about the uh, new generation? Okay. The question is, why do the children suffer? Hmm? Why do the children suffer? If you've done any kind of witnessing onto the lost out there, passing out tracts, standing there uh, on the square, preaching out of the scriptures and stuff like that, you know? If you've done anything like that, the Lord used you in any capacity to um, share the scriptures with someone, um, you're bound to run into the, why would a loving God kill entire races of people? Why would he kill? Why would he do that? Hmm? Why would a loving God Go and wipe everybody out, women and even children. And see, these Christians who preach the Jesuitical, <laughs> satanic love gospel, who want to evade the true fear of God, but want to be positive thinkers. Ha! <laughs> yeah, you'll be thinking positively all the way to, uh, to hell, okay? But... That's, a, that's something that you're going to run into. And a lot of the Church of the Living God like to skirt away from that. Like, <laughs> because the fact is, God did command the children of Israel, He commanded Saul, the children of Israel, to go into opposing nations and kill and slaughter everything. Man, woman, and children. And see, the confusion comes in for you lost people because you have these Christians telling you God loves you. God's not mad at you. God is not going to judge you. God's love is unconditional. <coughs> Big part. That's what I think of your love gospel. <laughs> love men to the kingdom. Hate the sin, not the sinner. But there again, brethren, you run into that, do you not? Any of you out there who have been used in any capacity in service of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, you have. Why does a loving God allow, why did he tell people to go, you know, his people to go and kill Entire races, men, women, and children. Why do the children suffer? Get your authorized version of the scriptures. The King James Version. Hey, you. You know that <laughs> Bible version that you're promoting? I looked into that. Oh, my Wow, uh, son, this is God's perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration word for English-speaking people. This is the text that you use to translate into other tongues, okay? The authorized version, the King James Version, guess what? It is a Jewish book. This is the scriptures, okay? This has all the verses. This points to Christ. This points to faith in Christ. You need the authorized version of the scripture, son. And I suggest to you that you cast away 
anything that is not the authorized version of the scriptures. You have questions about that? Go here on the channel. There are several videos addressing that. Okay? Go ahead. But you need the authorized version of the scriptures. If you're using anything else, it's just a Bible. Okay? So, turn with me in the authorized version of the scriptures to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy stands for basically the second giving of the law to the generation that um, survived from God's, uh, from the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And those people that wandered for 40 years, they uh, didn't uh, believe the Lord was going to do what he said he was going to do. And they uh, kind of gave the Lord a bad name. So this is the second giving of the, the law onto that generation that survived, okay? But we want Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 on to verse 11. Beg your pardon for that, brethren. I had to sneeze. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 on to verse 11. Please follow me along in the authorized version of the scriptures. You are expected to, and I will address you as though you are. Okay? You understand? Okay. Now remember, this is being addressed unto whom? The children of Israel. The nation of Israel. Okay? But we also have to remember for our instruction in righteousness what is being taught here. This is being said unto a nation. Okay? Unto a nation. But the implications are far more deeper than just for the nation of Israel. Okay? To instruct us in righteousness? Very good. Let's read. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hast cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor shew mercy unto them. Now, that also includes women and children. Why did he tell these, uh, the children of Israel to do this? Why? Why? Verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy you thee suddenly. So, now see, here's the thing you got to keep in mind, brethren, people. Um, God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, okay? He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He can see into the future. Um, his vision of time is not like ours, okay? Our Lord knows what's going to happen. But see, our God is fair, just, and equal, okay? Very fair, very just, and very equal, okay? And he is a God of judgment. God is known by his judgment. And we... His church, the church of the living God, his body, we fear the Lord. Okay? Beware of these perverse people who preach against the fear of the Lord. And just preach to you, love. It's a trap they're setting for you, people. Okay? But you got to remember, our Lord can see into the future where we cannot. Our Lord obviously knew that if these people, the nations mentioned in uh, verse 1, were allowed to live, that what would they do? Verse 4, For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and destroy thee suddenly. So, when our Lord 
had his children of Israel, his people, his nation, go forth and kill entire races of people, uh, men, women, and children. He had a purpose. Why? Because those people would turn away the hearts of the children of Israel. And look what happened in the book of Judges. Okay? Joshua went forth doing what he was supposed to do. But in the book of Judges, you see what happened when the children of Israel didn't do as the Lord had commanded. They were thorns in their sides and pricks in their eyes. Okay? There were snares onto them. And as you would read in the book of Judges, they turned the heart of the children of Israel away from their God. Okay? Let's continue. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, separate, put apart, other than. Okay? That's what holy means. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Does not that verse define for you very well what holy means? Okay? Verse 7. <laughs> Here's something that a lot of us need to remember. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. He has chosen the weak things to confound the wise, the small to confound the mighty. Okay? But because, because the Lord loved, okay, you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, now look at this. Look at verse 7. Don't look at me. Look at the scripture. Okay? Verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you. Love. His love upon who? The children of Israel. Okay? His love was upon them. Why though? Verse 8. But because the Lord loved, past tense, you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. Ah. Hath, he, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt? Now that oath unto his fathers, the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? Okay? That's, the, that's what he is referring to. Okay? He loved them. And because of that, because he loved them, his love was on this generation, these, the children of Israel, that were going to go in and conquer the promised land. Okay? Okay? But because God loved the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and chose, chose that line of Abraham. Address this in a two-part video, What is a Jew? Okay? But, and chose that line because he loved them, those of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have access to that love. But see, it's conditional. They have to obey what the Ten Commandments were, the law of Moses, okay? Remember, we're talking right here, what we're looking at doctrinally and dispensationally, this is for the Jew, okay? Today, in this dispensation, okay, God's love for you is at Calvary. And in order for you to receive the grace of God, the love of God, you need to be broken of your self-righteousness. You have to have godly sorrow for your sins that you committed against him. Okay? 
and you will have fear of the Lord if you come to him broken and contrite. The fear of the Lord meaning that you are afraid of him because he can put you into hell. Okay? Fear him who has power to cast you into hell after he has killed the body. Okay? See, these devils, the Jesuits and all that, they can only kill your body. They can't do anything to your soul. But God can put you into hell. And the fact that you're going to have to stand before him and give an account, that ought to scare the hell out of you. But see, you got these perverts who want to just preach the love of God. They, don't love, they have a problem with fear of the Lord. And you got these weirdos who, uh, you know, the just believe crowd. They're thieves and robbers. They climb up another way. See, they're too proud. They're the arrogant ones because they save themselves by their belief. Okay? Okay? See, you want God's love? You have to go through the cross. Brokenness, contrition, and fear of the Lord. And in the fear of the Lord, you will call upon his name. Which a lot of people have a problem with. Why? Because they're full of themselves. They're still in their pride. Okay? But let's continue. Now, again, you notice that? In verse 8, but because the Lord loved you, why did he love them? Why did why was his love there? Because of the oath of, that he gave unto the fathers. See? Okay, now let's continue. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Okay? So God's love is conditional, people. And this crosses dispensational lines, okay? You cannot have the love of God if you go up another way besides the way of the cross, okay? Belief is a major part of salvation. Yes, but how do you arrive at that belief? By just hearing the plain facts. The facts of the crucifixion of Jesus ought to break you. They ought to break you. Break that self-righteousness. Hearing the facts of the crucifixion and why our Lord Jesus did what he did because of your fault ought to scare you, humble you. And the fact that because he did that for you and you're rejecting it, he has every right to put you in hell. And he will put you on in hell unless you come to him on his terms. See, it's designed to break you of your self-sufficiency. And see, when someone saves themselves by just believing, it's their self-sufficiency. Okay? Hey, Smiley, you wicked pervert. You're sufficient in yourself, ain't you? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, get over yourself someday. Remember, if you want to turn against your order, the door is open. You turn against them and truly get saved, you talk to me. Come on. You truly turn against your order, Smiley? Okay, you do that. We'll have a live stream. I would love to hear you spill the beans on your order and expose them for what they are. I really would. Is that going to happen? I doubt it, but... But so see, when God tells the people, the children of Israel, go in there and wipe them out. Why? Because if they were continued to live, they would ultimately cause the children of Israel to turn from their God. That is why. And God is a jealous God. 
God made you, and he wants your devotion for him, not for idols. And he who made you from dirt has every right to want that of you. And not a force either, because if he forces it upon you, you're what? You're a robot, right? He wants you to choose him willingly, not by force. You have free will, unlike what the Calvinists teach. Okay? Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter uh, 24, verses 14 on to verse 16. Okay? Now here we're going to be getting into the thing about children. Okay? Like we just looked at in Deuteronomy chapter 7. The reason why the Lord had the children of Israel to go in there and wipe out everything of certain uh, kindreds. Okay? Why? Because if they were allowed to live, they would turn the children of Israel's hearts away from the Lord. Okay? And look at the book of Judges. Okay? Read the book of Judges sometimes. Okay? <laughs> um, it explains it quite well. And you compare that with uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 especially, and also in uh, Deuteronomy 32 and 28, and Leviticus chapter 26. Boop! Okay? It all, it's all tied together in a nice little package with a neat little bow on it, okay? But... Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 14 on to verse 16. Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire. Neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. Uh, you hire someone to do a job, you pay them. Honest wages for honest work, that kind of thing, okay? You do a service, pay them. But verse, look at verse 16. The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Well, you might be saying, well, okay, th then that's a contradiction, isn't it? Because did we not just see about how the Lord was telling them to go and smite everything? And when you read about Saul, he told Saul to go and smite the Midianites, I believe it was. Oh, uh, men, women, and children, and even the beasts. Because why? Because they would turn the heart against uh, away from of the children of Israel's hearts away from the Lord, and plus the Lord swore that he would have war with them because they met not the children of Israel with bread and that kind of stuff, okay? Different topic, but, okay? That's why he did that. There again, here in verse 24, in uh, chapter 24, Deuteronomy, he's addressing who? The Jews. Those who are called to be a holy, set-apart nation, Okay? These are the statutes that the children of Israel were to follow. Those of the children of Israel. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children. Okay? The ones that he cast judgment upon, whom he would know, who he knew, would cause nothing but problems for the children of uh, Israel. Again, read the book of Judges. Okay? This didn't apply for that. Because why? He knew what they would do. Okay? But now, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. A lot of people come to this chapter and will pick out certain parts of this chapter and harp on it and want you to believe that God is up there going, oh, I just, I'm so broken up because i got to punish these people because they reject me and hate me and refuse to repent. See, that's what these Christians are doing. But see, context. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 18. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 18. We're going to break this into pieces. Okay? We're not going to read the entire chapter. 
But we're going to break this into pieces. Let us begin with uh, verse, uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 on to verse 4. We have to go through these steps in order to answer the bigger question of why do the children suffer. Okay? So bear with me. The word of, we're beginning 18, uh, Ezekiel 18, verses 1 on to verse 4. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye? that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. Context, who is he talking about? Israel. Okay? As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul. Now you got to remember also, during this time period, during the law, that circumcision made without hands, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, the Holy Ghost, our Father, and the Lord is that spirit. Okay? Jesus in you is that circumcision made without hands. But under the law, the Holy Ghost was not a permanent resident. He could come and go, come and go. Therefore, whatever you touched with, uh, in your body affected your soul, okay? Now granted, God made all souls, yes, but not all souls belong to him, do they? He, he made every single soul out there. Yes, he did. But are all of those, do all of those belong to him? He has right to those souls, yes, he does. But do they belong to him as in a relationship? No. No, they do not. Yes, he made them. He has right to you whether you like that or not. But do you belong to him? He doesn't, he doesn't force you to serve him. He wants you to choose him. Okay? He wants you to make that choice. He doesn't force it at, on you at gunpoint. Neither does the devil. Don't forget that. Never forget that. Okay? Well, he created all souls. Yes, he does. Yes, he did. Not all souls belong unto him. And in context, he's talking about who? Israel. Let's continue. Okay? So, now let's skip down to verse 14. And then it talks about if a man be just, if he do this, he do that. Okay? Let's pick up at verse 14. Now, lo, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not such like. Now, see, from verses 5 on to verse 13, it talks about the difference between someone doing that which is just and right and someone who is doing that which is not just and right according to the scripture. Okay? And the son who sees his father doing ill or doing well, okay? Let's read verse 14 again. Now, lo, if he begin a son that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth and doeth not such like, that hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. This is all works, by the way. Okay? Remember, this is under the dispensation of the law. The dispensation of the law was faith and works. Okay? You are anti-Christ if you are saying it's faith alone <laughs> from Genesis onto Revelation. That's anti-Christ. Okay? Beware of that. Verse 17 that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increase, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes. He shall not die for his iniquity. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. So see what he's talking about. If the son sees the father, we just saw it. If the son sees what his father has done, and note it's, uh, it's talking about the father, not the mother. Hmm. Isn't that interesting, huh? But 
The son sees like, wow, my father is really messed up and in sin. I don't want to be like that. Lord, show me truth. Hence, but see if that son goes after his father. Let's continue, let's continue. Verse 18, as for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Now a lot of these Christians today, and these infiltrators, these sick perverts, twisting what God's love really is, and are afraid of the fear of the Lord. Go figure that. Yet ye say, why? Doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. What's the condition? The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Do you? Don't look at me. Okay? Don't look at me. You look at that verse. You look at the verse. Look at the verse. Okay? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. What's the condition? The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So, if the father, through his influence unto his son, the son do, does after the father, so then yeah, that child is going to bear the iniquity of the father. We just read it. But, if the son sees the sins of the father, it's like, I don't want it. Lord, <laughs> help me. And comes to the Lord, and the Lord save him. Now today, of course, this is under the law. Okay, this is under the law. But today, okay, you, you sons, you daughters out there who have wicked parents. Okay, and I, I actually know of a few of you that do. Okay, don't be like them. Come to our Lord Jesus Christ broken and contrite. And in fear of the Lord, call upon his name, that he may save you and make you a new creature. Okay? But if you follow down the path of your wicked parents, your father or your mother, okay? Verse 21, but if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed. Note the turning. Here's what the people who like to go to what we're about to look at and harp on that like to kind of leave out. Don't you? You wicked devil. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Right here. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? God delighteth in mercy. Okay? But you have to remember, our God is righteous, just, holy, other, separate. He cannot look upon evil. He cannot pardon evil, meaning he's not going to let you get away with it. Okay? He can forgive your evil. But see, you have to go to him on his terms, the way of the cross. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanseth the way all sin. Okay? But see, God is not up there saying, oh my God, as people go to hell. No, no, no. 
He delighteth in mercy. But see, if you reject what God did for you on the cross, you're his enemy. You hate him. You go up some other way with your, your satanic just belief, you hate him. Okay? Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God? And not that he should return from his ways and live. Oh yeah, there you go. That's that's right there. That there you go. That's what it's that's that's the problem with you devils. That's the problem. See, does God have, have I have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? And then you have these Christians telling you that God's weeping over the people that are going to hell. Okay? No. But what does God want? And not that he should return from his ways and live. Uh, that's called repentance. And see, these Jesuit coadjutor devils like Mr. Smiley Pants. Uh, they like to tell you that uh, repentance is going from unbelief to belief. See, that's a Jesuit tactic. That's euphemistic language. Changing the name of the condition, change the condition. Okay? God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. No, he doesn't. But he wants the wicked to what? And not that he should return from his ways and live. He wants the wicked to repent. You're not going to get away from that. Okay? And what is wicked? Being self-sufficient. Thinking you're a good person. Okay? Remember, James 2.19. The devils also believe. And they sure do. And they tremble. And they sure do. They sure do. The devils believe and tremble. Okay? Okay? But see, repentance here, turning from what? Yourself, your self-righteousness. What did Satan say unto Eve? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And Satan, in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 on to verse 15, what does he say? I shall be like the Most High. And see, you save yourself by your own belief or something that you do, the, the works of the law, you know, trying to be Jewish and uh, being uh, keeping the law is not a requirement, young man, for you to be saved or save, stay saved, okay? Got many videos where we address that. Go find them, okay? But see, it's repentance. Yes, repentance is turning. But what are you turning from? Today, you're turning from your self-righteousness. Even back then, it was your self-righteousness. A lot of self-righteous Christians out there. There's a lot of self-righteous people out there who can be broken, yes, but yet they still can't get over that self-righteousness. They love the world. They love their sin way too much. Okay? Now, Let's read from verses 25 on to the close of the chapter. Okay? Uh, you know what? We read verse 23. Let's continue. Let's continue to the close of the chapter. Okay? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and commit iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live all his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed and in his sin that he has sinned in them shall he die now you have to remember this is under the law this is not how it is for us today in this dispensation when you come to the lord on his terms broken and contrite and in fear of the lord you call upon the name of the lord and he save you and make you a new creature. You are sealed 
until the day of redemption. You cannot become unsealed. You are eternally secure. Once saved, always saved. You have God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost. You know, the Lord is that spirit living within you. That is the circumcision made without hands. That's why it's, he's saying the soul that sinneth it shall die because body and soul were connected in the Old Testament under the law. But now that Christ is in you, that seal, that seal and that circumcision made without hands, what you touch today, that's why you can eat pork if you want to because it doesn't affect your soul because the circumcision made without hands is in you. You don't keep this today to be saved or stay saved, okay? Doctrinally, this does not apply for us. You have to remember that. But see, what we're getting at is the repentance, okay? You can be a saved, born again, church of the living God. Yes, you can. And you can wreck your life and sin. Yes, you can. And still be saved. You're not going to lose your salvation. Um, the Lord would may hand you over for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, but you're not going to lose your salvation. You'll lose rewards. You'll lose your testimony. You'll lose effectiveness. Um, you'll lose anything, any blessing, monet, whatever it is down here to uh, help further you so you may edify the brethren. You can lose a lot of things, but you will not lose your salvation today. No, 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 no. No, we have to remember that. We have to remember that. Okay? But see, the ultimate purpose here is repentance. Repentance. Okay? Let's continue. So, under this dispensation, if someone was doing right and then they go and go into sin and God kills them, they're like, well, that's not fair. Verse 25, Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, and all you devils, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? See, God is a God of judgment. God judges. And those who are, who are of his body, the church of the living God, we judge according to this. Beginning with ourselves. Okay? Beginning with ourselves. We are to examine ourselves, prove our own selves, whether we be in the faith. Okay? But see, God is a God of judgment. And when you do what, uh, and in this dispensation, when you did it his way, what was right, you were okay. You went against that and went, in, uh, went into sin. His judgment was against you. Uh, he could kill you. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? See, you disgusting perverts who like to preach this fake love of God, which takes away judgment and the fear of the Lord, okay? You're preaching another Jesus. Our Jesus is a God of judgment. The Jesus of the scriptures, God our Father, is a God of judgment, of righteous judgment. Careful what you preach him, boy. And, and continuing, look at how our Lord explains this, okay? He's repeating himself. Why? So you can get it. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done, for his, for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because of what I've already explained about how the circumcision made without hands wasn't in this dispensation. Now see, that's, that's fair. That's equal. That's righteous. Under the law, do what's right, God will reward you. Do what's evil, God will reward you. God is a God of judgment. Okay? This is very important to get when speaking about why do the children suffer. Okay? Let's continue. Verse 28. 
because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed. He shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. Thus saith these Christians, the way of the Lord is not equal. They're preaching to you another Jesus. They are. They're cherry picking to preach to you a false gospel. O oh, house of Israel, are not my ways equal, are not your ways unequal. Now here's something that all you devils just can't stand. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways. Our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, in the red words in Revelation, even says that himself. Okay? Am I being too loud for you, by the way? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. <laughs> Believe and turn yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Repent. Repentance. What are you turning from? Your self-righteousness, your self-sufficiency. Okay? Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. And see, for someone who will not turn, who will not repent, you're God's enemy. God has made it very plain. But see, you lost people out there. You're deluded because of all the Roman Catholic Bibles that are given to you and have gotten away from the scripture and you're listening to people who who itch and tickle your ears who speak unto you smooth things who preach to you another Jesus God loves you that's not the God of the scriptures people it's not the God of the scriptures at all go to Isaiah chapter 57 Isaiah chapter 57 Just two verses. Verses 1 and 2 in Isaiah chapter 57. I, I've spoken on this before. Um, a foreshadowing of the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. But even more so. Isaiah 57 verses 1 and 2. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Have you noticed that the godly preachers of old, they have been taken away, such as, you know, Lester Roloff, um, stuff like that, um, people, you know, godly preachers uh, like that. Who's replacing them? Godly preachers who preach the truth of the scriptures. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come, he shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Who's replacing the godly uh, preachers and teachers? You want to know who's replacing them? The easy believism devils. The Christians who say God loves you, who preaches God loves you. Pacifistic Christians. That's why I'm not a Christian. 
And I'm definitely not a pacifist. Pacifism is satanic. Go to Genesis chapter 18. See, at, at the heart of this matter, brethren, at the heart of this matter is the judgment of God. And there are devils out there who want to pervert what God's judgment actually is. And preach this fake love, this Christian fake love, that's going to damn you to hell. Genesis 18, verses 23, on to verse 25. When Abraham was acting as intercessor on behalf of his nephew Lot, of course, but... Um, Check this out. This is something that you need to remember. See, children who die at the hands of wicked parents, wicked men. God is a God of judgment. God can forgive these people who perform abortions and who do sacrifice these children. Yes, he can forgive them. But see, they have to be broken and come to him on his terms. But see, therein, the point, God is a righteous God and a God of judgment who is going to reward everyone, including us, according to our deeds. Genesis 18, verses 23 and verse 25. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? Why hasn't America been destroyed yet? Hmm? That be far from thee to do after this manner. And this is before the law, by the way. To slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked. Look at, no, don't look at me. Look at that. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? We already looked at that in Ezekiel chapter 18. They're under the law. This is a dis different dispensation. Similar to our own right now. This dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. Similar, not exact. Okay? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I think I made mention of this in the previous video about Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Let's go there. You want some meat, boy? We got some meat for you today. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 6 on to verse 15. And here is what a lot of these devils preach. And these, you lost people because God's judgment isn't coming quick. Oh, <laughs> don't, don't you worry there, buddy. God's judgment will be coming. Then what are you going to say when it, uh, it's upon your head? Hmm? You're going to accuse him of being late? <laughs> Good luck with that. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 6 on to verse 15. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be. For who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. You're going to die. And you know what? I personally believe that Every man, woman, and child should experience death in order to scare the hell out of them or to remind them of where their focus needs to be. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. 
Neither shall wickedness, look at that verse, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. Neither shall wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this have I seen and applied my heart under every work that is done under the sun. There is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. And so I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city, where they had, had so done. This is also vanity. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Verse 12. Though a sinner do evil an hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. See, these Christians want to tell you, how can you love someone that you're afraid of? Oh, I say unto you, <laughs> how can you love someone that you're not afraid of? You fear the Lord, you love him. How can you love the Lord if you do not fear him? Answer me that. But it shall not be well with the wicked. Neither shall he prolong his days which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this is also vanity. Look at that verse. Look at that verse. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth, happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. You roll that verse around in your head a little bit. Then I commended mirth, happiness, you know, mirth. Because a man hath no better thing that under the sun, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life which God giveth him under the sun. But see the context in verse 14 and up to verse 12 actually, okay? If you fear God, you enjoy what he has given you. Yes, you do. But if you don't fear God, you use what has been allotted to you greedily without thankfulness. But see, it is well with them who fear God and those who don't fear God. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. The only reason you're alive, wicked man, wicked woman, is because God has allowed it because of his long suffering, wanting you to repent. He would rather be merciful to you. But if you reject him and you reject the, the gospel, what he did for you on the cross, you're his enemy. God's wrath is for you. You're a child of disobedience. Talked about that in several videos before, okay? Now go to Romans. The Romans. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 28 on to verse 32. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What happens when someone is given over to a reprobate mind? A 
okay? Now, see, there are some out there who preach what is called the reprobate doctrine, and they usually point that at sodomites and stuff like that, that saying sodomites can't be saved. I used to be a sodomite. I'm saved, okay? But what are these signs or what are the attributes of someone that has been given over to a reprobate mind? Now let's look at this. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, <laughs> whisperers, backbiters, whisperers, backbiters, in close context there, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. <laughs> yeah. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, see, you know the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So you know the judgment of God. But see, you want to pervert the judgment of God and make it soft and nice and sweet and sugary and henceforth damning people to hell. Because misery loves company. Doesn't it? Now, let's read in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 on verse 11. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Now, you got to remember about what we're reading here. Okay? Romans 1, 2, 3 are written that lost people can understand it. Why do you think these easy believism devils like to tell you that the pure gospel is in Romans 3 versus, what is it? Um, verses 21 on to verse uh, 26. Okay? They say that's the pure gospel. That's, they, they understand that because why? Lost people can understand uh, Romans 1, 2, and 3. Why? It's there for them to understand, to bring them to brokenness and contrition, repentance, that kind of thing, okay? The context here where he's saying, thou art inexcusable, O man, is for being addressed to those who are lost. You know, you get these lost people who think they're high and mighty, saving themselves by their own belief or their ethics or whatever, and they're judging all these other people, but yet they themselves are lost as well? That's the context. Prove it to you? Okay, let's keep reading. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Look at this. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth, judgeth them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? See, verses 1 on to verse 3 explain to you about verses 28 on to verse 32 in chapter 1. See, those of you devils out there that dispute this and uh, put up all kind of a stink about this, you've never been used of the Lord to bring someone unto himself by the Romans road. You've never spoken unto someone lost and been used of our Lord to guide them onto himself through the Romans road. You've never been used like that. It's obvious. Okay? It's obvious. You're not saving anyone with your gospel. You're preaching there, pal. You're damning people to hell. Okay? Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Long suffering. There's a difference between long suffering and patience, by the way. Okay? Not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. See, God's goodness on you lost devils. God's goodness is his long suffering. 
He's given you today because he wants you to repent of your self-righteousness. Okay? You think you're all high and mighty. You're lost judging people. You're, you're a lost sinner judging lost sinners. By what standard? Your own standard. We, Church of the Living God, we are saved sinners judging ourselves by God's standards. And because we judge ourselves by God's standards, we can judge you. See, why? Because we have God within us. And this is the standard. Not your ethics, not your morals. That's what he's condemning here. See, this, this is made to be presented unto the lost. See, you, you guys, you devils, you've never been used of the Lord to bring someone unto himself through the Romans road. You've never been. It's obvious. It's very obvious. You've never been used of the Lord. The only way you're actually being used of the Lord is to damn those people to hell who want to have their ears tickled. So, in a way, yeah, get, yeah, good for you. You're being used for God's judgment because you lost devils yourselves. You've never been used to the Lord to bring someone onto himself through the Romans road. He's never used you. He's never used you. But after thy hardness and impentient, not willing to bend, heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. There it is again. The righteous judgment of God. Paul and epistles here, pal. Don't look at me. Look at verse 6. Don't look at me. Righteous judgment here, pal. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. To whom by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious. Oh, I would love to name your names, but I know that's what you all want and I'm not going to do it. So, <clears throat> on you. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. To the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. To the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Doesn't that sound kind of similar to what we already read in Ezekiel? See, again, people, 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 listen to me. Romans 1, 2, and 3 are there for you and I as the church of the living God to preach unto the lost people, to show to the lost people. Okay, this is what God says of you lost people in Romans 1, 2, and 3. Okay? Romans 1, 2, and 3 are specifically there for us. For us as the church of the living God. You know, Romans 10, verse 14 Okay, where it talks about those who preach, okay? You begin in Romans 1, then 2, then 3, then 4. And then uh, by the time you get to Romans 5, you ought to know what you're dealing with. Someone who is either contentious or someone whose your own eyes have had the privilege to see broken to a sniveling, crying mess before you. You'll know because the Lord will allow you to see it because he's working through you through the scriptures speaking to that individual. Breaking that individual through his word. See, you lost devils. You've never seen that. You've never seen that. You've never been in that position. You've never, you've never had the privilege, the privilege to see someone go from death onto life right before your eyes. You've never seen it. You've 
never seen it. Go to 1 Timothy now. 1 Timothy chapter 2. See God's judgment. God's judgment. This, like I told you. 1 Timothy chapter 2. God's judgment is imperative. Because when it comes to children suffering, God's judgment. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 on to verse 6. Uh, let's read verses 3 on to verse 6. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. God would have all men to be saved. It's not this Calvinistic heresy. Okay? Not that at all. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, 2, Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. One verse. One verse. God wants all men to come to repentance. Verse 9 in 2 Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Broken of your self righteousness. Okay? Broken of your self righteousness. God is a God of judgment, and he is known by his judgment. God wants all men everywhere to repent. But see, not everybody is going to come to him on his terms. Okay? Hence, he made everybody. You're here because the Lord allowed you to be here. But you're not his unless you come to him on his terms. And if you reject what he has done for you, God's wrath is upon you. God's love, again, is at Calvary. Go there on his terms. But see, no, you want to go up another way because brokenness of your self-righteousness, oh boy, it hurts. But that's the requirement. But you don't like that, do you? You don't like that, do you? Go to 2 Samuel. Here Now here, here is where we're going to get into a lot of the meat of what we're talking about. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. And actually, I should have done this before. I am going to need a ribbon marker for this. Because we're going to be doing and we're going to be doing some stuff here. 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. We will be reading verses 1 on to verse 14 to start. And then we are going to be doing some expository on verses 13 and especially on verse 14. <laughs> okay? So, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 on to verse 14. This is after... David done murdered Uriah the Hittite by the sword of the enemy, laid with his wife Bathsheba, and she was with child of David, born of um, with child in adultery and in murder. Okay? This is after this. Second Samuel chapter 12. Verses 1 on to verse 14. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nursed up, 
and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat, and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. That was the love, the cherished love that Uriah had for his wife Bathsheba. Okay. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared not to take of his own flock, and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But took the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Now, David, in a moment of righteous indignation, being guilty himself. Hmm. It's interesting how guilty people react when certain things are obviously against them, unknowingly against them. It's interesting to see how guilty people react, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Should have seen that myself. But And, okay, David is guilty. I'm spoiling the surprise for you, but so what? David is guilty. You, you can read verse uh, chapters 10 and 11, okay? And David, in his guilt, is putting off the, well, his, I'm righteous. He's transferring guilt into his anger on this thing, okay? See, he's transferring. Okay? Check this out. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Now, what is very interesting is, you could now, Nathan came up to David, thou art the man. Samuel went up to Saul. What is this bleating? Of sheep and oxen that I hear in my ears. You can you can directly compare the two. Okay, I did a video on this um, of talking about uh, King Saul, his fear, paranoia, and chaos. Okay, when King Saul was confronted of Nathan, what did he do? I'll I'll be sure to link the video on this one. <laughs> okay. But um, what did King what did King Saul do? He blamed the people first. He did one of those. Okay, y y yeah, yeah. I sinned. I sinned. Okay, but but it was the people. It was the people. And see, Saul even went as far to say, "You're okay. I've sinned, but go with me now, so my people can see 
and be with me and offer a burnt offering for me. Okay? He wanted Samuel to be with him to offer an offering for his sin so the people would see it. See, even in that, King Saul was still concerned about man. The comparison between someone who is lost and someone who is saved. The lost person, when confronted, blames others and does a half-hearted repentance. Not a true repentance at all, but in order to be seen of men, you have your reward, boy. But what does the godly who mess up and sin, what do they do? And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Look at that verse. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Now, the Lord put away his sin. Thou shalt not die. You see that. And yes, God used David mightily. But see, this has to be mentioned. Um, uh, you see verse 11 and verse, uh, you ver see verse 10 and 11 and verse 12, what we just looked at. Um, yes, God used David mightily still after his sin, but his sin cost him mightily. David had mighty consequences for his sins that he committed. God still used him, but he paid a heavy price for his sin. His own sons, two of his sons were killed. He was kicked out of his kingdom for a while. His one daughter was uh, raped by his son. He had wars continually. The Lord fulfilled verses 10 on to verse 12 onto David as a consequence for his actions. Yes, the Lord still used him, but he paid a heavy price. Beware of those who like to point to you about how David sinned and God still used him. Yes, he did. But don't forget the cost that it cost David. You can, you can go ahead and read from 2 Samuel from ver, uh, chapter 13 on and see what a heavy price David paid for that. Okay? But look at verse 13. Okay? And here's where I need my uh, ribbon marker. Okay? And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That's it. That was it. No, they, they, it was his fault. It's, it's their fault. Uh, yeah, I did it, but he's the one who told me. Yeah, yeah, no. Full responsibility and accountability from King David, unlike King Saul, see. But Nathan said, and Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. What does that mean? Go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And look at verse 13. Thou shalt not kill. There's two down for David right there. This is also uh, echoed in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 18. Let's go there. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 18. Verses 17 and 18. Thou shalt not kill, neither shalt thou commit adultery. <laughs> verse 19 in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Neither shalt thou steal. So David killed Uriah the Hittite, committed adultery with his wife, and stole his wife away from him. Wasn't looking too good for King David. But 
Go to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. Yes, the Lord had a great amount of grace for David. But that grace came at a heavy price. It cost David a lot. See, these Christians like to tell you about, you know, to comfort you in your sin. Hey, you're in sin, but hey, remember, David sinned, but God still used him. See, that's perversion. Yes, God did still use David. Amen. But see, what the Christians tell you there, dear friend, that what they're not telling you, excuse me, is what it cost David. That's what they're making light of. But Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 on to verse 14. Leviticus 20, verses 7 on to verse 14. Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, separate, other. For I am the Lord your God, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. For every one that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. It is. Oh, 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 let's keep let's keep reading. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both them, both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter, with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man also lie with mankind. As he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. Overdoing the point there, but looking at verse 10 again. Okay? God takes very serious sexual perversion. Today, he can forgive you for it. Yes, he can. But sexual perversion. Sexual perversion cost you. You know what it cost me? Because of my sodomy before I was saved 13 years ago, because of my sodomy, I'll never have kids. Because of my sodomy, I have memories that cannot be erased. And there are those out there who have contracted diseases because of it. You pay a heavy price. If you're of the church of the living God and you mess around with sexual perversion, yeah, God can still use you. But dear friend, keep in mind just what happened to King David. Don't ever forget that. Because guess what? God won't let you. Verse 10, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall, be, shall surely be put to death. And, and one more, Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. See, as a lost man, I had a relationship with, with a married woman. I, I, I confess that in my testimony unto all of you. I had a, a relationship, a three-year adulterous relationship with a married woman. Under the law, I deserve to die. King David, we just saw it. King David deserved to die. Proverbs 6, verses 27 on to verse 35. Here's a little thing about adultery. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? 
Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? I said this to an NLP practitioner one time who uh, mind controls people, Tony Robbins followers, to walk on hot coals. I showed him this. Oh, boy, he didn't like that. But anyway. So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. You can be forgiven, but you won't be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his household. See verse 30 and 31. God is not condoning thievery to satisfy your soul with your food or whatnot. Because why? If you're caught, you deserve to be caught. You're caught. You're going to pay what you uh, deserve to pay. Okay? You reap what you sow. All right? Stealing is stealing. There's no getting around making stealing right. If you do it, what does it say? Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. A thief stealing, even if, his, if, even if he is hungry, is not right. A man who is burning in his lust goes after a married woman. Oh, you get the point? Let's continue. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Job 28, 28. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor he shall get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Now, God can and will forgive you if you commit adultery. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. He can forgive you. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth away all sin. Okay? you you got to be of the church of the living God. Of course, for that to happen, and you got to go to him on his terms. But God can forgive you. But you know, to the man and to the daughter, unto the marriage that I had a part in destroying. If I were to go to that man today, and he wouldn't forgive me and shoot me in the head, he'd have every right. If the daughter of that husband, the daughter of that woman, were to shoot me in the head, kick me in the stones and spit on me. They would have every right. The Lord has forgiven me for that, absolutely. But if that man or that daughter were not, I had a part in destroying a marriage. The woman that I, I lay with, she was not innocent either. We both deserve to die. I came to the Lord broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord. I called upon the name of the Lord, and he saved me and made me a new creature and forgave me that sin. Absolutely. But you see, a wound and dishonor shall he get. His reproach shall not be wiped away. You'll be forgiven. But if I were to go to beloved Dennis, that was his name, and his daughter's name was Madeline, if I were to go to Dennis, he'd know right away. He knew about it. Was he of the Church of the Living God? I don't know. But see, I know what that's like because I was that man. People have tried, tried uh, talked to me before about it's like, well, Brad, if it hadn't been you, it would have been someone else. I am the man. I am the man. Do you get it? For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. See, because when you're one flesh and you defile that, like I said, if 
that man nowadays were to come to me and just not say a word, look at me, look me, uh, size me up, pull out a gun, and boom, he would have every right. Because I deserve to die for that. See, I am the man. Go back to 2 Samuel now. Looking at verse 13 again. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Verse 14. How be it, by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And here we go. The child shall surely die. Why? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. And we saw, in looking at verse 13, God's righteous judgments against those that commit adultery. It was death. See, today it's different. We're not under the we're not under the law. See, son, we're not under the law. No one could keep the law perfectly. No one could do it except God, and he did, okay? Not even David could keep the law. Not even Moses could do it. Oh, yeah. But see, God's righteous judgments. God, according to the law, David should have been killed. But God put away that. But verse 14, How be it because this, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. We got quite a bit to it, uh, to, uh, quite a few uh, references to go through here, so hope you're ready. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 15, on to verse 27. David, he was, he was, he got a little wax fat. He was feeling a little proud of himself. He was taking advantage of the blessings. We saw the Lord, it's like, hey, if this if what I had given you had been too little, I would have given you more things. Why did you go outside and steal something that didn't belong to you? What was at the root there? Deuteronomy 32, verses 15 on to verse 27. But Jeshurun, highly favored, waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. King David did that? Uh, bro, yeah. Yeah, he did. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. How did David do that? Beg your pardon. He was thinking with another head. Beg your pardon for that. The body. Sexual lust was his idol. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the capital R, rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Which David did when he was sinning with Bathsheba, getting Uriah drunk, and then ultimately killing him. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy, with those which are not a people. 
I will provoke them to anger with the foolish nation. I also talked about this, about uh, what is a Jew, okay? For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. And I will heap mischiefs upon them, and I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger, and devoured with burning heat, and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust, the sword without, and terror within. And the sword never departed from David's house. Shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, and the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. Look at that verse, look at that verse, look at that verse. God said, the sword will never depart from your house. Tamar was a virgin, okay? Absalom and Ammonon were young men. And the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. Onto his deathbed, David paid the consequences for his sin. Verse 26, I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Verse 27, were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy. God doesn't fear anything. I've talked about this in videos before. Lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely. And lest they should say, our hand is high. And the Lord hath not done all this. See, the enemy would be saying, I did this myself, when the Lord's like, no, I allowed you to do this. That's what he's talking about. It's not that God fears anything. Who is God to be afraid of? No, what he's talking about is, you know, this I know that thou favorest me, because thou will not let mine enemies to triumph over me. I just bradized that, beg your pardon. But, the enemy who God allows to have some victory over his people, okay? They have to be reminded, hey, I allowed you to do this. You couldn't have done this unless I allowed you to do it. When it comes to those of his body, the church of the living God, remember the book of Job, chapters one and two, God won't let you do anything against us. And if you do something against us, it's because God has allowed it. You can't do anything unless, against us unless God allows it. And oh boy, that really burns you, doesn't it? You wicked scum. Doesn't it? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You angry, bro? <laughs> Just a little bit. Now, go to Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9. Now, Exodus chapter 9. Keep this in mind. Because of what David did, his sin, God put it away. But because of what David did and God allowed him to live, the enemies would have heard that and blasphemed the Lord. Okay? His name and reputation was at stake. Whose? The Lord's. Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 on to verse 17. Talking about Pharaoh. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may, that I may smite thee, and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to shew in thee my power, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. As yet, 
exaltest thou thyself against my people that thou may that thou wilt not let them go so basically god used pharaoh to uh, prove a point to make an example of him you can also read in romans chapter 9 verses 14 on to verse 24 which we might as well go there and do that as well, okay? Romans chapter 9, verses 14 on to verse 24. Romans 9, verses 14 on to verse 24. Romans 9, verses 14 on to verse 24. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that sheweth mercy. Are you devils, you easy believism heretics? <laughs> there you go. But see, then again, these wicked devils say that Romans 9, 10, and 11 are for the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble. Oh, people, don't, don't fall for these idiot devils. Please. They're damning you to hell. Please don't fall for these people. Verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might shew my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? And we already saw that he will have all men to come to repentance. He wants everyone to be saved. But not everyone's going to come to him on his terms. Let's continue. Nay, but O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? What does this mean? You. You want to save yourself with your belief. Who are you to question what God has chosen? See, you save yourself because you just believe. Okay, you arrogant pond scum. Okay, you just believe. So you're saved, right? Who are you to say anything against the Lord about what he has chosen. He has chosen the way of the cross. Brokenness, contrition, fear of the Lord, and calling upon the name of the Lord. But see, you want to go up another way. And you want to preach this fake, sissy love of God that isn't the true love of God, which is Christ and him crucified. And you want to be a little pacifist. Ugh, good luck. Verse 21, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, what if God, willing to shew his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, making examples? Making examples. Uh, you know you devils that are alive, patting yourself on your back. Don't hurt your elbow doing that, by the way. Patting yourself on the back about how much uh, damage you cause. Um, you know the Lord is keeping you alive to make an example of you in judgment when he finally destroys you. <laughs> Keep smiling, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Smile all the way to hell, you scumbag. Yeah. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Hmm. So God's judgment and his name is pretty important. Now, go to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. Okay? Remember, God's great name, his reputation, okay? He let David live, but the enemy is just like, wow, David did all that and God let him live? 
What? Joshua chapter 2, verses 800, verse 14. People knew about the Lord back then. The true Lord, the true God of the scriptures. See, people know of him. You lost people instinctively when you hear this garbage preached to you by these Christians that God loves you. Uh, Christian pacifism, just believe, and it sounds off to you. Why is that? Let me give you an example. Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 under verse 14. And before they were laid down, this is when uh, uh, Rahab hid the uh, guys from Israel who came to spy out the land and whatnot. She hid them, okay? Before Joshua and everybody went around the city seven times and then the walls fell flat, okay? And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know Rahab, the harlot, talking about Israel, about that God of Israel that they heard of. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Why is that? For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side Jordan, Sheon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shewed you kindness, that ye will also shew kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother, and my brethren and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business, and it shall be, when the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. So see, Rahab and her people, people of Jericho, heard of the Lord and of his righteous judgments and what he did to the uh, people of Egypt. Hmm, interesting, huh? Go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5. First Samuel chapter 5 when the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant and the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it from Abinazir unto Eshdod when the Philistines took the Ark of God they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon and when they of Eshdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. So the ark of God being put set uh, put next to a pagan satanic deity. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Uh huh. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod until this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them, and smote them with emrods, as even Ashdod and the coast thereof. So, if these Philistines didn't know, they definitely were getting first-hand experience of what it is to mess with anything of the Lord. And when the men of Eshtad saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us. Yeah, get it out of here. For his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon 
our God. Look at that admission right there. They're saying, yeah, the, the God of the Hebrews, that's the real one. Our God, yeah. And they sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. And it was so, that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And it came to pass, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us, to slay us and our people. Huh? God's reputation is well known amongst his enemies, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, God is well known amongst his enemies. Isn't that strange, huh? So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of God, of, uh, send away the ark of the God of Israel, and let it go again into his own place, that it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that died not were smitten with them rods. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. Chapter 6, verses 1 on to verse 6. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. And they said, If ye send away the ark of the God of Israel, send it not away, and send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering. Heathens offering unto the Lord something, because they had trespassed against him. Isn't that something? Then ye shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall we do? What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all and on, on your lords. Wherefore ye shall make images of your emeralds and images of your mice and that mar the land, and ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Peradventure he will lighten his hand from off you. And from off your gods, and from off your land. Wherefore, then, do ye harden your hearts, listen to this, as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts, when he had wrought wonderfully. Among them, did they not let the people go, and they departed? Hmm. Isn't that something, huh? Isn't that something? So, the enemies of the Lord knew all about it. Hmm. And because of this judgment, David being let to allow to live because of what he did, God's name would have been blasphemed among the enemies. You let David who did this live Yes, he did all that. According to your own law, he should have died. Why are you letting him live? All right. Go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. We're going to stop here because this will probably be a uh, two-part video. So, Deuteronomy chapter 4, we're going to read, okay? And I'm going to stop this right now, and we're going to make a part two of this, okay? So, see you in the next video, all right? Remember, in the next video, we're going to be picking up on Deuteronomy chapter 4, all right?